I think I need some assistance now because I have a fireside chat, which means I am allowed to sit down. I hope so. <laughs> Can you bring some chairs, please? So, um, you, uh, as I said earlier, for everybody who came a bit later, um, so you have the description of um, our program and also the description of the background from our speakers here. Um, I give you a bit more of our fireside chat, um, where we actually talk about artificial intelligence and assistant. And um, I'm really excited to be at the Serious Games Conference and I actually I have to say thank you again to the creator Susan and also to Mr. Schaeffer that you made me come back because I find it very inspiring and, and actually contagious to be here to talk about those things and to connect the people that are in this program and to, talk, and to give you more of an insight what they are working on on a daily basis. Um, so. That's why I'm really happy um, that we have our next uh, speaker here in the fireside chat. And I was talking with her already this morning at the breakfast and we were to chatting away and ph philosophically um, questioning everything in this world and what does that has to do with artificial intelligence. Well, our fireside chat is with um, Roberta Luca. That's an Italian name, in a, and she is a Brazilian, and she is living in London, and she's, uh, she's a London tech enthusiast, and she's helping their um, entrepreneurs and young uh, women to, to raise the bar and to integrate technology and make technology better. Um, what she's, her background, you, as I said, you find it there. Um, she's a BAFTA winner. She's a co-creator of Bossa Studios, where she also just launched the new game, which is called Worlds Adrift. And if that wouldn't be enough, just launching a new game, which is, by the way, an MMO, and it is um, community created. Um, also, on the other side, she just also uh, is the co-founder of uh, Boulder, which we will talk about. Um, as I said, there is an assistant system with AI that could help you. And then on top, she has a new YouTube channel, so I think there is three startups in one, or I, I guess one is a scale up. Um, and a part of that, she told us yesterday that she's also painting her apartment. So that's a lot for one person, from one petite person. May I ask you to uh, give a great welcome to our um, fireside um, chat with uh, Roberta Luca. <laughs> is there some <laughs> Thank so. you. Wow, that was a well, nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are happy you are we are you are with us here. Um, I think we have so much to talk about, and I'm actually happy that we have so much time. Um, I want to talk um, with you, maybe first about the whole background. So, because um, a lot of people in the serious games industry know Bossa Studios. Um, your YouTube channel is beta, and beta, beta means driving, learning, what does it mean? Yeah, so, uh, well, beta is progress to me, right? It's uh, when, you, yeah, when you are creating a software, a piece of software or a game, and you have that in beta, it's still in development, and you have a lot of people to help you to be developed. So, That's and also your childhood nickname? Yeah, there was beta? a childhood name. Yeah, exactly. So my, yeah, my parents used to call me beta as I was growing up. And as I started to build the YouTube channel, I was like, should I what should be the name, right? It's like very, very important branding decision. Um, and, and I went back to my roots and I said, yeah, maybe I should, should say it's Peter as opposed to Roberta Luca and yep. have connect more with the younger audience. You call yourself an unconventional entrepreneur and um, a seeker for learning all the time, which then says, oh, okay, that makes sense that you call it Peter. Um, you have been named uh, one of the 35 top women under 35. And you also have been named um, the top women in game, top 30 women in game. Um, I'm actually like, I can relate to things like that. What did you think when they uh, voted you in this group of people? I was pretty shocked. <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> okay. So I, I, I think I can, I'm not sure how many women we have at the audience, but basically I think we all, uh, sometimes confuse competence with confidence 
And very often we double down on being more competent every day, hard work, building something new, make something better. You know, if you have, a, if, if you work for, for someone and you have a boss, you want to kind of showcase what you're doing. But very often we, we have uh, so-called imposter syndrome, which we, makes us believe that, you know, we're not, we're not good enough to be doing what we're doing. And so when you have those sort of awards and the BAFTA award was another one of these, you're like, wow, actually you realize that you're doing a lot of cool things that are impacting the world. So it's very humbling for me. Uh, you can look back into 15 years of game development, 20 games, I believe. Otherwise, that is, that is yeah. a long way you already <laughs> have come. Um, in, like, in, uh, as I said, you just launched uh, World Drift. When you say, um, I said it's community crafted. You are helping basically people to create something together. Correct. Can you, can you say in a nutshell, what is World Drift about? So, uh, so World of Drift is a massive multiplayer online. Uh, we have been building it for the last three years. And we typically say that we have been co-creating that with 10,000 people over there. So, which includes again, gamers, 10,000 10, people. people. So basically our community. So we have been working on open development since the beginning. And that means that we have gamers and influencers and makers and creators and designers all building the world together. And um, one of the magazines, good, you know, uh, large gaming magazines in the world called Edge, uh, said that we are the next Minecraft, Ooh. which is like no pressure. <laughs> you just but launched, right? Yeah, we, they, we just launched say? in early access. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the first, you know, milestone of the game. But the point is, it, it is a persistent world, uh, all simulated. So effectively, everything that you do there has uh, a meaning in the world. And it's basically floating islands in a massive scale 14? world. F floating, floating islands. Uh, floating. In mm -hmm. a massive scale world where you have to build uh, ships together and build the world together with other players live online. So to me, the significance of that, now that we have many dozens of thousands of people playing the game, is that we, it's, a, it's a grounding place where people are connecting to each other. So they basically, they need to connect to each other to build something together. And to me, that's very, very meaningful. That's, um, when you, uh, let's, let's talk about how you develop games like that. When you're saying, OK, the game is about creating something together. How did you come up with this game? Um, I just saw that you, um, you are, with uh, Bossa Studios, you are a scale up. You just uh, have been going from 40 um, employees to 90 in yeah. half a year? Yeah. <laughs> how do you manage that and how do you create games like that in yeah. such an environment? So uh, from a culture perspective, I'm very glad to have amazing co-founders and a great management team who has been helping us all to build, to scale up the, the, the business and also our investors as well. So we, we were building kind of smaller British humor games. I don't know if you guys play games, you might know about Surgeon Simulator. Do you know Surgeon Simulator? Yeah, some nods, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're the creators of Surgeon Simulator and I am Brad. And, uh, and Surgeon Simulator went viral on YouTube and it's like super loved kind of game. And so uh, we went from doing smaller games to building something bigger out of the investment we raised Series A uh, last year led by Atomico, which is the largest tech VC in Europe. So and it was set up by um, the, the founder of Skype. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the way that we create games is quite an upside down type of way that traditional games do. We don't uh, create the games as game designers or, or games producers. We actually let the team do that themselves. So we have uh, game jams on a monthly basis, which are like hackathons. So in the jam, it's 48 hours that people, all the teams can gather together, create new ideas of games, and there are only two rules. Uh, one rule is you have to pitch your idea to somebody else so that you don't work on your own. So your idea needs to be really good. <laughs> and a lot of ideas die out of that, right? out of non-persuasion. There's, um, there's not a bad idea, is there? There's not a bad idea, exactly. There's just a funnel of ideas that actually end up creating something amazing. And the second uh, um, 
rule is that at the end of the 48 hours, the game needs to be playable. Oh. And it can be a very kind of small core amount of the game, but it needs to be playable so that we all play together. And we usually have some guests and kind of judges and people from the outside of the community to kind of have a look at the, those games. And so all of our games, including World of Drift, uh, nowadays come out of game jams. So the teams have full autonomy and purpose on what they create, and they have a whole emotional attachment to what they're doing. It's not about us telling them what to do, it's them creating something. They, they created it, and so they have an emotional... Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's stick to that, because f the 48 hours, that's, uh, for me, that sounds like uh, that's a lot about uh, that says a lot about Bossa Studios. For me, that sounds like it's a lot of, about uh, autonomy. Like everybody is free to work and say, "I have this idea. I want to do this." Or are they always waiting for? Oh, there's the end of the month. That's <laughs> when we do the hackathon. Let's do it then. How is that? Like how, how is that in the daily business? So people, are, I mean, in the day to day, they're working on their projects, right? Uh, when when. Uh, game jam time comes. I think there are two very interesting things that happened over the times that we perfected that, right? So we, we, didn't, we didn't get it right in the first couple of game jams. But two things happened. One, uh, there's, there's a massive uh, trend in game developers to actually build games as indies in their bedrooms because you have tools like Unity, right? That anyone can create a game on their own. So a lot of people have great game ideas, but Employees of Boss actually they decide to bring their ideas to the company to work with their colleagues as opposed to doing that on their spare time. So they, they bring their love for games to work as in addition to work. Uh, and second thing as well is is the this the sense of purpose. It's like I, I am the one and responsibility, right? I am the one creating something here. And I'm not going to be so much attached to my idea because everything is about the execution. Everything is about collaboration. It's how I'm going to make this idea happen with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so it creates this kind of creators. Uh, usually as a creator, you would have a huge, huge attachment to your idea. And in that manner, you don't have that anymore because it's all about creating something great with other people. Uh, I assume it also brought you to a lot of questions about how to be a good leader. Yeah, as well. So, and that, 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 that was very interesting because as I was building, so we have been building Boston Studios for eight years. And as I was building that and learning about being a, a, becoming a better leader myself and managing people and understanding, you know, helping them to move forward in their careers, I, I, I had, of course, uh, a lot of great mentors and I had executive coaches, which I paid a lot of money to help me to, you know, perfect my, my skills. Because uh, sometimes books are just not enough, right? Books are just one size fits all, and you, you're not really focusing on the on the particular things. So just like you know, Olympians and great athletes, they have their, their coaches, their personal coaches. And so to me, it was like, what if I could align my knowledge of games, uh, my at the time basic understanding of AI, um, and nowadays much deeper understanding of AI and coaching and neuroscience techniques into something that it's actually in your pocket, huh. that you actually talk to on a day-to-day -day basis and ask you tough questions in life or helps you to navigate your career or whatever, you know, your self-awareness as a human being. So actually, that sounds like exactly what I saw on your webpage of Boulder. So this is <laughs> definitely how you yeah. got to this idea of creating the other company called Boulder, yeah. which makes, which is the, the, the word bold. Yeah. You want to um, inspire people to become bolder. Exactly, exactly. Tell us more about that. So uh, Boulder came out of this realization that what if, you know, we mm -hmm. created something that actually millions of people would be able to be helped on a day-to-day basis uh, on their phones. And so the first iteration of Boulder is this, uh, you know, it's called Charlie. And Charlie is purposely, the name is male and female, Charlie. And Charlie is, uh, is an artificial intelligence that it's an NLP that has a lot of knowledge into coaching techniques and neuroscience and ask you questions on a day-to-day -day basis. So from your messaging uh, service, you talk to Charlie and Charlie asks you 
about seven to ten minutes questions every day and that helps you to figure out where you go in your career uh, how you're feeling and you know from life to career purpose what I found on your webpage was, uh, let me quote here, only 15% of people are engaged at work worldwide. According to Gallup's um, Escape the City research shows that um, 71% want uh, a clearer sense of purpose in their career. Many of them spend 25 plus years uh, of their lifetime working. That is 30% of their lives not living up to their potential, not in love with their job, not connecting to their higher purpose, nor being their authentic selves. Are you saying that Charlie can help me to find purpose, can help me to, to see what are my goals and to reach that? Is that a real assistant as a coach, as a life coach? That's the vision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, it's always good to have a high vision. Uh, yeah, that's the vision. The, the, the problem is very clear. So uh, when, when I started to research and dig down into building border, I talked to a lot of millennials, I talked to a lot of, a lot of people, and, and it's, we, we all know the stats, right? People are disengaged at work. Yeah. They, they, are, you know, they, they are actually fulfilling their lives and outside of work because they, they don't find something that some something that is connecting to them there, and uh, and I think majority of the, the the problem comes from the fact that there's very low self awareness, there's mm. very low um, amount of time that people spend on really understanding their values, where they're going, what do they really mm. want. It's their tough. Strengths. It's very tough. The strengths, and and so the the. How, how bold is tackling this, this issue is actually from the very, very basics. Mm -hmm. And it's not like woo-woo thing, life, co life coaching, but it's more grounded into psychology, into neuroscience, into habits, right? The habits that we create on the day-to-day, -day on our day-to-day -day lives, that kind of takes us into a path that sometimes is not ideal, and that reflects back on our insatisfaction uh, with work. So, so I, I believe that you know, with the engagement that people are having with Boulder, that helps them to figure out what they really want. Mm -hmm. I think I, I have a couple of an anecdotes. I had over a thousand people using Boulder so far, so it's by invitation only. So I'm kind of very protective as how I'm, I'm increasing, I'm expanding the service. But uh, people already told me, "Oh, can I date Charlie?" Like, wow. Oh, hang on. Are we at this uh, movie, Her? Yeah, exactly. You fall in love with Charlie? I know, I know, right? I was like, no, so you, you must really be kidding. So you seriously got the question, can I, got I date the question. Charlie? Yeah, yeah, I got the, the question. And, and it's very impressive how much people are sharing. So, of course, I have a, it's all anonymized data, so I don't, I don't kind of share individual stories. But as, a, as an overall, I can tell you that people share a lot. And... And I think that has to do with some, there was research that the University of Southern California did at some point, that it was in the environment of therapy. And they, they had two groups that engaged with a, with a virtual therapist. And one group, they knew there were humans behind the screen. Another group, they were told that there were no humans, it was all machine based. And that particular group that believed they were dealing with machines, they revealed much more about their lives. So, th so the ones that, uh, that were talking with machines, th who yeah. knew that this is a machine I'm talking yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. They, they were much more willing to reveal things about their lives. Oh, let me guess, because they think they, nobody is judging me. Yes. So that, that was, you know, the, the paper, one of the assumptions is that, that there's no barriers of empathy of judgment you know there's a lot of things that people and usually nowadays i can see millennials are much more comfortable to share things online other to share with the, another people another real people you, you just said the word millennials uh, are the yeah. millennials the one the 1000 who are using charlie already do you know i don't know you, i you don't, don't i did not ask that question yet <laughs> You want to ask that question. I want to ask that question. Yeah, yes. it could be really insightful to see yeah. who is that. Because we were talking about that earlier with Susan. Um, Wiser is the other platform, I think, in Great Britain. I saw this video where the kids or um, teenagers 
um, they don't want to open to adults or they don't want to even talk about their emotions with other teenagers. Th that what you're saying is basically saying, okay, they, maybe they want to talk with AI and get solved their problems because tell, tell a teenager, to, hey, how about you see a life coach? They're going to say no, right? Okay. Do you think there's a high potential that they all could, like we could help teenagers and young adults um, to become a better self and become themselves or understand themselves much better when we use AI? Definitely, I think uh, a, a lot of the a lot of the you know current health, mental health issues we're seeing within this bracket, millennials and Gen Z, is uh, is actually the, this uh, this social sometimes social inability to deal with the, the, the offline and the online world. Mm. And, and they, they use the online world as an outlet for, for being themselves. Because sometimes the, the, there are a lot of constraints in society that especially when you are a teenager, right? You discover yourself, you're trying to understand who you are and what are the boundaries of the things that you do in your life. And, and society has uh, put a lot of pressure on us. Choose a career, be the best, do this, do that. You know, you need to, you need to have a level, uh, um, grade A all the time. You have to be the best in your class. You have to be the best at work. And that is very daunting, right? Because yeah. they are competing in a they global manner now, nowadays. And they're stressed. And so if there's, a, if there's an outlet for them that they feel that they can talk to someone or something, that can help them and not judge them on mm. what they're saying. I think it's a very positive thing. I hope that I can manage to help them on that, that road as well. Um, so Charlie could be such an outlet. Um, help us to understand much more how Charlie works uh, in comparison to Alexa. Like, uh, how, how does that work? Is Alexa, I ask Alexa a question, but this is just facts. Um, and I understand Charlie is like a chatbot, right? Yeah. So what is, like, how can you uh, call Charlie a mental health coach? Mm -hmm. What is the comparison to everything we know? Um, is like, for instance, Alexa. So uh, it's exactly the, the reverse. So with Alexa, you drive the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you ask the question to Alexa. You say, Alexa, what is the weather? Alexa, tell me something. Tell me, sing me a song. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite hilarious if you ask that. Um, she's doing that. She I know. does that. She yeah. does, yeah. And she, she, she does uh, Christmas songs during Christmas time <laughs> as well. So go figure. Um, and um, with Charlie, it's different. So Charlie is actually the one asking the questions to the person. It's not voice yet, it's all text-based. Text-based, um, okay. Yeah, but it's, uh, he, he, she drives the conversation. So he has a, a set of questions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that, and each session with those questions would last about seven to 10 minutes every day. And, and it drives you into the path that it believes is the right path for you within the question. So let's say that asks you a question today, uh, how do you see yourself in five years? And then following that, following your, your, your reply, it will give you something else as a, as a decision tree that is becoming smarter and smarter every day to kind of lead you into the tough questions that you need to answer to yourself. So Charlie is learning from everything I said yesterday, basically, or yeah. it's like uh, taking on the conversation, hey, that's how we ended yesterday, let's fur continue with this further. Yeah, yeah, it continues the conversation on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's, uh, the, we, we worked a lot, so speaking of empathy, which is a, something very, very crucial. Uh, in the beginning of building Boulder, I was like, how can I not be so, such a terrible chatbot? Because the majority <laughs> of chatbots out there are so bad, right? And I spent a lot of time with the team crafting the, the words. So uh, Charlie has a personality. So I got a games writer to help me with that, to create a personality for Charlie. Uh, Charlie is sometimes challenging, sometimes supportive. Mm -hmm. um, also, certain keywords and cliffhangers on each session, they are very importantly kind of crafted as if, as if we b build a game, right? So a game needs to be highly engaging so that you, you would have value out of that. So, um, so we went through very particular things about the language that Charlie uses to get the best out of you and the answers that you have. And then over time, we have a backend system that it's matching your words 
with the, the corpus that we're creating from neuroscience and coaching techniques. How can I become one of the 1,000 people? I can invite you. <laughs> okay, so it's an invited yes. group now. So I can invite you now, yes. Okay, and then it's uh, on Messenger or like... It's what? on Facebook Messenger at the moment. Okay, yeah. but it's your algorithm and everything is safe. Because yeah. You know, in Europe we just had this... I know, that, uh, yeah, the elephant in the room, Facebook. Uh, no, it's, uh, it, it's all with us, it's all safe, so uh, we're looking to, do, well, GDPR safe, so it's all, you know, tick the boxes and everything is safe and, and Wow, and it, it sounds yeah. really interesting, I'm, I really like to look into it. As I said, I, I checked out the web page, I'm like, hmm, that sounds interesting, that's such a different way that Alexa is here and all the others yeah. going through. And as I said, I was already looking into this and we're talking at our institute with psychologists, how could we help kids? I think that's really interesting that you can see, oh, they would reply to an AI much better than to a human being because that's, that's where they engage much better. I know, it's almost like the, if, if, if they feel, and I mean, that's all, all about humans, right? We, we want to feel loved, we want to feel listened to. Yeah. And, and because we, we're overstimulated about everything and over distracted on everything that we do, uh, those moments of, of connection, those moments of listening, those moments of doing something together, they are very special. And, and you see that with Minecraft, and I hope that, you know, if you play Worlds of Drift, you're gonna see that in Worlds of Drift as well. There's a, people are taking different roles. They are supporting others. They, they are the traders, they are the builders, they are the, the, the flying people, they are the- And they can look the however they want to, right? Exactly. You have uh, every skin color, yeah. every hairstyle, every whatever you want to be. Exactly. So I think, you know, that there is this, the, the similarity between the two companies, basically me who created one thing and kind of, you know, is, is kind of cross-pollinating with another. But I think the, the, the two, the, the game and the service, they, they all kind of bring us back to humanity, using technology to bring us back to humanity. Mm. Well, you just said it, uh, we want to be listened to. Um, your third project is your YouTube channel. Yes. Um, I mean, you also said that earlier, I remember you said there was someone who uh, was kind of a mentor for you, who helped you to raise your voice. Is, is, you, is the YouTube channel now raising your voice? It is, funnily enough. So I'm, f I'm facing a lot of my fears <laughs> <laughs> of exposure specifically yeah. because obviously I, I, I as, yeah, then as everything I said is before, it's like I, I, I'm a doer, so I love doing things and not necessarily kind of talking about those things. But, but sometimes you have to talk about those things so that other people know what, you, what you're doing, but also they get inspired and they po possibly they, they, they're being impacted in addition to being impacted by your, your products, right? Um, yeah, I, I had, I had a, a fantastic boss who at some point when I was still working at Nokia before I started Boss Studios and... Uh, so, sorry, how, did, how long did you work at Nokia? Uh, three years, mm -hmm. for three years. And uh, so it was particularly uh, Virtu. I don't know if you guys know Virtu. It was the luxury division of Nokia, and about a thousand people company. And there was the, the the annual conference, and my boss said, "So are you gonna talk about your product at the conference?" I was like, "What? Me on stage? <laughs> like, no way." He was, "But I don't get it. Why not? You should do that because that's yours. You're gonna let someone else talk about your product." you should go there and to me it was like it was such a light bulb moment and I was like I should should I and I know that it feels you know majority of men will, will think that that's silly of course you should be talking about the things that you're doing but when you are kind of developing especially for women I guess majority of us we yeah. don't think that that's a thing that we should be doing that more often and I think the there's a massive value on mentors uh, both men and women mentoring more women to achieve the things that we can possibly achieve. So I'm very grateful for him. So you said it was a male mentor. It was a, it was male, yeah. Oh, yeah, I it is, right? I have, I have the same experience with yeah. my boss. Yeah, you need someone who says you can do it. Exactly. You do it. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's also what you do with like that's why you called your uh, um, the Charlie um, the company Bold or Boulder. Um, also, what you're doing with your YouTube channel. You're saying, uh, and I want to quote you here, I want you to become bolder every day. Yes. <laughs> so basically, you want to be a role model and say, hey, if I can do it, you can do it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, I, 
See, I'm Brazilian. I have a broken English. I <laughs> <laughs> you don't. I, ha I, I think you have been living long enough in London. Long enough. Nobody, nobody right. can hear that. So, 12 years in London, um, and you know, I, when I got there, I had no networks. I had nothing. I, I, you know, I just had a job, and and you know, and after fast forwarding 12 years, I I think I managed to create some really special things that I, I'm proud of, and I enjoy, and I love what I what I what I do, and I think. If someone like me can do that, you know, it, it is possible. It is possible for you to. It requires hard work. It, requir it requires competence. It requires confidence. It requires a great network, a great great people around you. So my co-founders have been, you know, amazingly important in all of my journeys, because uh, I know that I have. We have complementary skills. And, and I think, uh, you know, going back to what Ed was saying about even technology and AI augmenting ourselves as human beings, it's like we need to be surrounded by more human beings, but also more technology that would allow us to get to our purpose in life. So I hope that with Beta Luca, more young, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs can see that and say, hey, it is tough. But it is possible. Hmm. Um, you, your background is computer science, right? But you yeah. don't program anymore because you don't have that time for that, I, I guess. Don't. I don't. You know what? Okay, you're gonna hate me about that. But I, <laughs> uh, after, after um, about two years after I graduated, I was like, oh gosh, I'm a terrible coder. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I. It's, it's just because I don't. I don't have enough. You know patience to be in front of the computer night and day. <laughs> and so I said to myself, I'm going to use that logic that I developed from my brain to actually put that into building businesses, mm -hmm. which is something that I love doing. And so I, I think I can combine creativity with logic, with business all together and make sense of that to create something that is valuable to but the But isn't world. that also uh, being a part of a good leader that you understand, oh, someone is better in that than I yeah. am and I, I, can, I have another strength there. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I ask you a bold question? Yes. And that's regarding the female role in the whole industry. Do you think that women can create more empathic worlds and more empathic products? That's a very good question. Uh, short answer, yes. Long answer, I think, I think there, is a, there is something about minorities, right? Or minorities rep rep representation in, in, in work and in any communities around mm -hmm. there. Um, either, either you're a minority from a gender perspective or from a you know, s social level perspective or whatever it is. You actually, you're much less constrained by the um, by the rules. So, in a way, you you have to be much more creative on how how you're gonna add to the work that you need to do, and and much more nuanced about how you influence people to do the things that you need to do. And I think naturally, um, massive generalization, right? So naturally, uh, women are a little bit more listening and a little bit more mm. kind of nurturing to understand empathy and to understand how to navigate those things to to get to the to the goals that they need to get. And so and so, I think if we can use more of this side of the brain of a lot of women, we will be able to create more empathetic, empathic more empathy within the machines that we're creating. So yeah, I, I hope so. I hope it can help a lot. I have more questions, but I want to save them for the panel discussion where we draw the picture for all of you together where why everybody was talking about their different parts in the industry. Um, but maybe one last question. Um, Ed talked about uh, like how to integrate in teams different uh, disciplines, and I think the word here is interdisciplinarity. In your teams, like what are the different backgrounds? Um, everybody is a designer or a, a game creator, or where are they coming from? So this is hugely important. Uh, yeah, we're super multidisciplinary, and we also uh, multinational. So within the 90 employees that we have right now, we have 30 nationalities. 30 out 30. of how many people live uh, 90. Right there? 90. Yeah. So oh. uh, so we, we're very broad, you know. And, what's, and what's the biggest group? <laughs> I think it's British. Oh yeah, well, yeah, okay, London. Because we're based in London, <laughs> right? Um, 
but yeah, we have people from all over the world. Um, so, so I think it's hugely important. We have we have people who came from finance, who came from consulting, who came from games, who came from technology, who came from, you know, I came from entertainment. I worked in a in a TV broadcaster back in Brazil for seven years. Um, mobile, so it's like it, it's it's very broad. Uh, we have about a third of the team are designers and artists, another third are games creators and developers, and another third are business and HR and support teams, supporting teams. So yeah, it's it's hugely important, and and it's hugely important specifically during the game jams because they all kind of get together yeah. and have their brains from a different perspective to mesh That's and cool. create that creative tension to create some awesome things. That's that's pretty cool. As Ed said earlier, we create something that comes from your imagination. Everybody, when you, everybody has a different background, the imagination is so different. Absolutely, because you, you, if you have a lot of people who think similarly, yeah, you you will face the same problem, and you think similarly to 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 overcome that problem, right? Yeah. When you have people from looking from different perspectives, you always have the, you know, it's, it's the, the theory of the, the brainstorming, right? You actually have something that out of the collective is much better than individuals. Yeah, cool. Um, I have to say we're running out of time and I really want to thank you for your time today for the fireside chat. Um, I invite everybody else um, with your questions for the panel discussion later on um, or just grab me at the break and tell me if you have to go earlier and say, hey, that was the question I really wanted to uh, get out to Roberta. So thank you so much for, uh, you. for being with us. And I see you later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.